So I had a dream the other night. I dreamed I looked like that. I really did. I dreamed that my life was perfect. I woke up, and it looked like that. You ever had that? Yeah, the dream I had? No, not real. And some of you are living in a dream you wish wasn't real. In other words, <laughs> your dream has turned into a nightmare. Don't want you to raise your hand. But how many of you are not where you thought you would be at this season of your life? How many of you are not driving what you thought you would be driving at this season of your life? Think about all the ways life has disappointed you. I mean, we have these great dreams, and then we wake up one day and realize, oh, this is not at all what I dreamed. I know there's a couple. I have to be real careful here. I'm going to look right at that camera because I don't want you to see me looking at them. I know a couple in here that got married and woke up, and they were living with the in-laws. Now, that is a dream that didn't go as planned, right? But it was a good thing because they got great in-laws. I asked permission if I could tell that story. You guys, there's all kind of broken dreams in this room. There's some marriages that just aren't what you had hoped for. There's some relationships that are really going south. There's work that you're looking for, a job, you're doing everything you know to do. And you're just watching your dream die. I mean, let's be honest, this, this, is, this is a season where, whether it's because of COVID or whatever the problem is, that our dreams have been affected. Well, God has a word for you today. He's got some encouragement because... In Jeremiah, this prophet had to tell the people whose dreams were dying, it's going to be okay. Now, it's not going to go well for a while, but you're going to be okay. Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet for a reason. It's because he had one of the hardest jobs ever. And there were people in the land that would tell the people the opposite. Oh, yeah, they were saying, all you got to do is just, you know, Sign up here, you just click here, you follow us, and your life is going to turn around, and you're going to be great. Back in the day, it was in 1995, and your life will never struggle again. They're lying to us. They lied in that day of Jeremiah. But God has a word for you. I want to encourage you today. No matter what dream might have died, no matter what dream might have faded, God has another dream for you. And every time we do a top 10 verses, every time I ask, okay, what, what's your favorite verse? What are the verses God used to get you through? This one ends up in the top five. Most of the time it's number one, but it's at least in the top five, verse 11. But the problem is people don't read the first 10 verses. Because the first 10 verses help you make sense of the promise that God gave us. And the first 10 verses are about broken dreams. So if you've got a Bible, I'd love for you to take it and open it to uh, Jeremiah 29. If you've got your device, you can turn uh, to Jeremiah 29. And let me just welcome those who are streaming. It's always a joy to have you. And especially in these days, we're so thankful for the ability to be able to have you join us um, because it's been an unusual season. There are a lot of things that have happened that I never dreamed would happen, but they have. But it's okay, and I'm glad you are still able to be connected to us and a part of us. Let me just describe the situation. The, the Babylon Empire, the Babylonians were bad people. They were really, really cruel people. Jerusalem was the holy city. I mean, it was the queen city for the Jews, and, and all of a sudden, Babylon overthrows the Assyrians. Babylon defeats Egypt. And now Babylon is taking the children of God out of Jerusalem. And literally being led away as exiles. And the city is being destroyed. Around 600 years before Christ, it started happening. The prophecy you're about to read happened probably 10 years after the first group was deported. And you know some of the ones who were deported, at least you know a little bit of your Old Testament. 
a young man by the name of Daniel. Daniel was very young when he got taken to Babylon, and he had three guys at least with him, good friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they come into play later in the book of Daniel, but they are a part of the exiles. And so now Jeremiah is trying to tell the people it's going to be okay. And he's got a letter he's going to read, and we're about to read the letter that he has for the exiles. And there's evidence in Daniel chapter 9 that those exiles took the letter with them. In fact, there's some believe 50 years later, they are still remembering the letter we're about to read. And why was that letter written to them? To help them dream again. To help them know it's okay. God has other dreams for you. Don't give up. And so I want you with me thinking in that way. Let's open it up and let's read. Let's just start with verse 1. i to give you the context and kind of the, the way it, it begins. These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exile and to the priests and the prophets and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. So what do you do when it's not your dream? You wake up and you're in a foreign land. You're in a situation you never dreamed would happen. It's certainly not your dream. Your marriage failed. I've yet to meet one divorced person who said, oh yeah, this was my dream. No. Broken homes, it's not ever your dream. And yet, that's exactly what he's saying to them. I know it's not your dream. But I want to show you something. Even if it isn't your dream, do you remember this simple truth? No matter the circumstances, God is still in control of your life. You believe that? Say it with me. Just say it with me just like it's written. No matter the circumstances, God is still in control of your life. You know how I know that? Because that's what this letter says. Did you know as you read through this chapter, it actually says God sent them to exile. God sent them. You mean God would allow something like that? Yes. God would send them into a very difficult time. God allowed their dreams to be crushed. Yes, because there are things God wanted to show them. There are things he wanted to teach them. I mean, even Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king, is called a servant of God. So can God use pagan places? Yes. Can he use an office where the name of the Lord is taken in vain every day? Yep. Can he use a neighbor you can't stand? Yep. Can he use a relationship you don't want to be in? Yep. He's in control. And as he is in control, he has something to say. But the problem is we keep hearing noise. You know why? Because there were false prophets that day. And he calls them out. Look at this verse. For thus says the Lord of hosts. Anytime you see that, thus says the Lord of hosts, that is God's way of saying I'm the one who created the heavens and the earth. You need to hear what I'm about to say. And listen to what he said. The God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you. And do not listen to the dreams that they dream, for it is a lie. We have any of that today? Surely there's, I mean, everything you read on the internet is true, right? I mean, it's, it's accurate. All those podcasts, surely there's not deceivers out there. No. I, I just think TikTok is accurate in every way. You can believe everything. And I'm on it all the time. It just makes me laugh and then makes me cry. So I just think surely this verse is for us. Quit listening to all the voices and start listening to your father. He is the one that has a message for you. 
And so God says, just don't listen to them. So when it's not your dream, what do you do? Make the most of it. Redeem reality. Redeem reality. Paul even said in Ephesians 5, we're supposed to make the most of these days even though they're evil. Redeem it. Make the most of it. How? Well, look, let's see what he says. I'm reading in verse 4. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses. Live in them. Plant gardens. Eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons. Give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. In other words, God said, I know it's not your dream, but just settle down and live. I mean, the fact that he told them this, let me put it back up. Look how many verbs are in this. These are actually commands. Build houses. Live in those houses. Plant gar- Who wants to plant a garden when you live in Paganville? I mean, who wants to plant a garden? God said, plant a garden. Why? So you can eat the produce of it. Take wives. Oh, my goodness. And have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons. Give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there. Do not decrease. In other words, God says, just live. A guy in this church told me one time, he had a professor that told him this, wherever you are, be there. Wherever you are, be there. And I think sometimes we don't know how to do that. Because we're always upset thinking, this is not the way I intended it to be. Okay, let's get over the reality. It's not the way you intended it to be, but it's the way it is. But God has still got plans for you. Many years ago, John Steinbeck, <clears throat> Pulitzer Prize winner, Nobel Prize winner, wrote a book called Travels with Charlie, which is a book about him taking his dog across the country. And literally traveling across the United States. He makes a statement in that book, 99% of Americans want to be somebody else living somewhere else doing something else. That book was written like 65, 70 years ago. Things haven't changed. I meet people all the time that they don't want to be here, they don't want to be there, they don't want to be what they're doing, they don't want to be where they are. And God's just saying, you got to embrace the reality of what's going on in your life and redeem it. So how do you do that? And he gives the answer. Verse 7, one of my favorite verses. But seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. Now, I want you to think about that a minute. What does he tell us to do when we're in a job we don't like? What does he tell us to do when we're in a neighborhood we don't like? A city we don't like? (laughs) Maybe a church we don't like? What does he tell us to do? This is what he tells us to do. Seek the welfare of wherever you are. Seek the welfare. Seek the good. I'm going to come back to that word in a minute. It's an awesome word. Seek the welfare. Pray. Literally. Pray to the Lord on its behalf. On whose behalf? On behalf of that job you don't like. On behalf of that relationship that's not going well. On behalf of that neighborhood. On behalf of that city. On behalf of a country that's lost its way. Yes. Seek the welfare. And pray for its welfare. Because it's in seeking its welfare. Say it with me. You will find your welfare. You want to make it real practical? Do you know why I prayed my heart surgeon would have a really good day before the surgery? Why I prayed for her blessing and the Lord's goodness to her? You know, because that's going to mean I got a better chance, right? I mean, that's a real practical, simple, but apply it to that place you don't want to be. Has it ever dawned on you might be there because the Lord wants you to be there? You might be the blessing that that place needs. And i got to be honest with you, I, I didn't come today prepared to just talk about this. I came prepared with a list 
and my frustrations. I've been through so many funerals. I've lost some great friends. Got another one Tuesday. A great friend. And I'm just tired of just what's happening around us. I'm tired of the way I watch a country respond. And so I came with this list of, of frustrations. If I can be just really honest, I had a list. I got it up there on my desk. And I wrote down everything that I think is wrong with this country. And I'm standing in my garage getting my bike ready to go on a bike ride early one morning, and the Lord spoke to me. It's either the Lord or one of my cats, and I'm, I'm believing it was the Lord that said this. He said, people don't come to church and stream the service to hear your frustrations. We, they all have them. They come to hear from me. And they come to hear hope. And I'm telling you, as the Lord began to speak to me, I realized my frustrations don't change anything. You know what it means to be frustrated. You know what it means to struggle. You know what it means to hurt and your heart be broken. But what we need today is something that actually works and changes something. I don't understand everything. He does. This is not my moment. This is his moment to speak to his people and to give us hope. So listen to what God is saying. And what he's saying is, no matter how frustrated you are, be a blessing. No matter how difficult it is, be a blessing. And realize that you get to choose how you respond. You can either curse the darkness, or you can light it up with the love of Jesus Christ. And I just think today, we need to choose that. We have looked at a country expecting them to bless, expecting neighbors to bless, expecting work to bless. I'm not sure that was ever the point of this country or our neighbors. I think we were here to bless first. Because in the welfare that we pray for, for those around us, that's where our good comes from. So it's like, as we give blessing and bless others, they bless us. So you know what? I, yeah, I'll give you some simple advice. Lower your expectations for those you work with. I even heard it given as marriage advice. Somebody said, well, how'd you stay married that long? They've been married like 60 years. <laughs> and the answer was, lower your expectations. <laughs> I'm serious. That's as honest as it gets. But you know what it means? I'm not in it for me. I'm in it to be a blessing to them. Now, if I get blessed, which God said I will, that's great. What I love is when I see people going through pain, when I see them going through suffering, and they are a blessing. Let me tell you about one of them. He's been my buddy for, ever since I met him, 2007, I think it was, I met his family, one of the greatest families. Butch Rowley, his picture will come up. Butch and I just, I mean, he, he, we just connected. and In fact, he, he was a rabid Gator fan, and the only Gator gear I ever got was from him. And, uh, I mean, he just absolutely walked with me. Well, he and his wife, Julie, went in the hospital with COVID. And I don't understand this. She responded, and she walked out. And she's great today. Butch never walked out. And so about two weeks ago, we lost him. And the reason I'm telling this story is because in his last days, we were texting back and forth, and I, I got to read you the last text that I got from him right before he, they put him on the vent. And I will tell you this. When they were rolling him into the intensive care area to put him on the ventilator, he couldn't talk. He's on oxygen. You can, you, you've seen this, the picture he look, he's in the bed, and they're rolling him in. He looks over, and there is a cleaning crew cleaning the floor of the hallway. And this guy's down there on his knee, you know, doing the cleaning. And he looks up to see who's in that stretcher, and Butch sees him, and Butch does this. Who is thinking about the cleaning crew when they're dying? And he couldn't even breathe. And so Butch sent me, this is, we had a lot of texting going back and forth because obviously I couldn't get in to see him. 
But this is a text I got from him. Happy Sunday, brother. It was on, obviously a Sunday. I, I'm yours, David. I want to help you. I want to help our church on a daily basis. Uh, whenever and wherever you need me, I'm there. I can move mountains because of my unwavering faith. And then the last text, early September. Thank you so much, David. I'm so glad Jesus is here. I won't give up. I feel like God has a very big plan for me. Can't wait to share it with our congregation. Thanks to you and Rachel, I love you. Well, today, I'm sharing it with our, con our congregation. This is Butch's moment. Now, I'll tell you his story <laughs> to tell you that here's a guy who is in his last days. He's got a plan. I took a screenshot of this. It's a post-hospital game plan. Uh, he was a coach. He loved to coach. It's not what he did by profession, but he loved to coach. Post-hospital game plan. Here's what he was going to do when he got out. Celebrate each day. Pray nonstop. Read my Bible constantly. Church every Sunday. Call David and see how I can serve immediately. Tithe. Go for a walk with Julie, his wife. Watch the sunset, sunrise. Smell the flowers. Feed the birds. No more negatives. Write thank you letters and calls to friends and family. Butch never quit dreaming. He had a plan. And God had a plan. And Butch, in his worst moment, was not saying, God, why me? Why is this happening to me? What's... He was dreaming. How can I redeem my life? How can I make a difference? So what do you do when it's not your dream? You make the most of it. And you ask God to help you redeem it. You know why? Because God has a plan. God always has a plan. And this is when we get to the good part, the verses that most people remember. They just don't read the first part of it. They read this part. God has a plan. Read with me. I'm starting in verse 10. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you. I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you. Here's the verse, verse 11. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare, not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. Then you'll call upon me. You'll come and pray to me, and I'll hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And then 14 goes on. He continues to say, I will be found by you. So let me, let me just say this. God's working on a plan even when you don't see the plan. Even when you can't see his hand, trust his heart. God has a plan. There are things that he's preparing for us. In fact, Paul said it this way. One of my favorite verses in the Corinthian letter. He says that no eye, things which eye has not seen or ear has not heard and which have not entered the human heart, all that God has prepared for those who, what? Love him. That means that God has stuff for you you can't imagine. It means he's got a plan for you. You couldn't dream it. You haven't seen it. You haven't heard it. But he has it for you. Now let me warn you. God's plans don't always work out by the weekend. He's got a plan. But it may not be done by the weekend. And we get so frustrated with him when we pray and nothing happens, so we give up. But he said, don't give up. I got a plan. And what is that plan? Oh, I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Let's put that verse up because it's a big one. Verse 11. I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare. I know some of you are going, well, if it keeps going like it's going, I'll be on welfare soon. It was an unfortunate choice the ESV made when they interpreted it, welfare. You're going to be shocked when you see the Hebrew word for it. You know it. And it's one of the most awesome words. Here's the word. Shalom. Shalom is one of the most beautiful greetings in the Jewish culture even to this day. I mean, we have a completed Jew right over here. And I told her, I said, hey, one of your words coming up today 
shalom. You know what it means? Peace. It means contentment. It means may the Lord fulfill you. Shalom. And the Lord says, I've got that plan for you. People try to interpret that as prosperity. Well, it may be prosperity, but it's prosperity of your soul. More than it is prosperity of your stuff. And that's what he says, I promise. I'm going to do that. I, evil, I'm not planning evil for you. God is not out to get you. If he was, he would have already gotten you. But he's out to bless you and to give you peace. And he says, and I'm going to give you a future and a hope. You know there's a future coming. He said, hey, I'm going to come back and get you. I'm not going to leave you, and I'm going to bring you home one day. I mean, he gave them an incredible promise that they were coming home. But he also said, it is going to be better than you ever imagined. And do you know what happened during the exile, those 70 years? Some of the greatest movements that ever, during Jesus' day, started in the exile. For example, every synagogue that we know of traces its roots and the ideology back to the exile. When they didn't have the temple to go to, what do you do? You gather in groups, wherever. Personal devotion. When you don't have all the stuff, what do you do? You just learn to walk with God by faith. There were so many things God did in the exile. And what I believe is some of the greatest things we ever experience come out of a season of our life when we're not sure what's happening. That's when God works. I mean, he does awesome things. I remember standing in a little church. My first church had 21 people in it. I remember standing one day. Nobody was there, like a Saturday, because I was only there on Saturday and Sunday. I was in college. So here I'm standing in this building. And I said, Lord, I don't know if you could do this, but I would love to pastor a church one day of 100 people. Let's see. One, two, three. Four, five, I think we got it. I think God heard and God did more than I ever dreamed. He had plans that I couldn't even imagine. And that's the future that he has for you. And I know one day we're going home. Because the truth is we've all been in exile. You know that. When Adam and Eve sinned, what happened? They had to leave the garden. Remember? Bye-bye Chick-fil-A. You're out of here. No more garden, no more perfect, and everything was broken. So basically, the story of the gospel is how God is going to deliver us from the exile we've been on. And you know what? He made a way when he offered his son, Jesus, on a cross to remove that barrier of sin, your sin, my sin, not Jesus' sin, our sin, so that you and I by faith could believe. And now we walk into relationship with God. And guess what? It's not over there. He's preparing a place one day, and it's going to be like it was in the garden, and it's going to be perfect. So you telling me, we're in an exile, but we're going home one day. We're going to be home and we're going to be safe and sound. And even between now and then, we have hope because he's with us. Most people never read this part of the verse. This is past verse 10, obviously. Then you will call on me and you will come and pray and I will hear you and you will seek me and find. You know what God really wants to do in your exile? He wants to draw you to himself. You know what he wants to do in your dream that's not working out? He wants you to come to him. In fact, I believe it's the greatest thing that could happen when it's not what you dream. Is that your broken dream will lead you straight to him. And God said to them, come, you'll find me. I'll be here for you. I had a friend, real close young lady, Friends of our family. I was friends with her family. I was their pastor. She was a student at Louisiana Tech. Louisiana Tech University is in Ruston, Louisiana. I, I actually took a master's level history class there called patristics. I just tell you that to try to impress you. You say, what's that about? I'm not sure what it's about. It's about history. The history of the church. I mean, it really was a pretty, pretty neat uh, class, a seminar. But the road that I had to travel to go there was um, trees all along it and kind of at night 
spooky deer running across, everything happening. Amy told me one day, David, I almost didn't make it down that highway. She was driving home from college, and her dreams had not come true. They had been destroyed. She didn't have a relationship, and she had dreamed God would give her a young man that would be just perfect for her. She had no relationship. She really wasn't doing well in school, and things just weren't working out. And I mean, her dreams were gone. And she said, as I'm driving along, she said, you know where that curve is, and there's a big old oak tree, and other cars have hit it. And she said, I know how easy it is. Just turn my wheel to the right, and I can hit that tree. And I can get out of this nightmare, because this is not the dream that I dream. She turned the wheel to the right. And she's headed straight for that tree. And she said, I don't know why, I don't know how, a verse came to my mind. You want me to show you the verse that came to her mind? For I know the plans I have for you. Plans for your welfare, not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. She said, I didn't even know where it was. I just had heard it somewhere, and it came back to me. And as it came back to her, she pulled the wheel back to the left, corrected, just slammed on the brakes and stopped and just started weeping. You know what she did after that day? She took an index card and wrote out that verse and put it on her steering wheel. So she had to look at it every day. And I believe God brought you today to hear that and to tell you it's okay. Yeah, you're not in the dream you dreamed, but you're in a dream that God has for you. And so let's pray that our struggles will take us closer to Him. Let's pray that our exile or our broken dreams will actually keep us near the cross. Jonathan McReynolds wrote a chorus. It's one of the most powerful moments. And I think he just wrote it and just impromptu started singing it at a concert of his. And here's what he said. May your struggles keep you near the cross. May your troubles show you that you need God. May your battles end the way they should. May your bad days prove that God is good. And may your whole life prove that God is good. You know what I pray for you? What I pray for me? What I pray for everyone on the string? Everyone in this room, I pray this prayer. Because I know you're going to struggle. I know you're going to have a broken dream. But I pray that those struggles keep you near the cross. Troubles show you you need God. And then on your worst days, may it prove that God is good. In fact, may all our life prove that God is good. Can we just bow for a moment? Father, that's our prayer. And that's what we ask in this season. So, Lord, we want to sing this as our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to do something. I want you to just sit, listen to it. And then there'll be a moment for us to stand and sing it. But this is a prayer. I want you to pray as Ryan sings it over us. May your struggles keep you near the cross. And may your troubles show that you need God. And may
So I want us to change the words a little bit because I know a whole lot of us in here this is our dream this is reality but that's okay because our prayer is may my struggles keep me near the cross we're going to change the the verse just a little bit and Ryan will lead us and help us I want you to stand and I want you to sing it out with him and I want you to make it your prayer And we're just changing it just enough. May my struggles keep me near the cross. May my troubles show that I need God. May my battles end the way they should. May my bad days prove that God is good. Let's sing it to him. May my struggles keep me near the I just know this morning, I I almost asked, okay, who in here is living a nightmare? No, I'm not going to ask it because I think I know the answer a whole lot. But what I want to know is, are you ready to say, okay, Lord, I'm going to make the most of it. I'm trusting you because I think your plans are better than my plans. And God is going to do amazing things through this season of your life, whatever it is. We want to help you. We want to pray with you. You can text the word CONNECT to 40777. Whether you're in the room or whether you're streaming, you can still do that, and there'll be someone to follow up. We also, for those of you in the room, we have folks at both sides, Welcome Centers A and B, um, that would love to have a conversation with you. So maybe today you're really hurting, and you just really need somebody to pray for you. I would be the first in line. When you say goodbye to good friends, you know, as a pastor, I don't care how long you do this, I've just never gotten good at saying goodbye. And I always look up and say, God, I don't understand. You know what God says? I know. You can't, but trust me. And one day, you'll understand. So trust him. And the best way I know how to close this time is with that beautiful word, shalom. And in the South, we say it this way, 
Shalom, y'all. Have a good day. God bless you.